Our topic today is on the Sutra for Inhalation and Exhalation, the Anban Shoyi Jing. Very interesting, and uh, we could say maybe that it is uh, the missing link between the original teachings of the Buddha and teachings that came much later all the way to our current day practices, particularly in the Japanese school. A little bit further background that Buddhism, like many philosophies and uh, religions, uh, went through many transformations and that there are a number of different schools of, uh, of uh, Buddhist uh, practice. Uh, here at Marble, we say we're of the Chan school, a Linji lineage. This uh, Chan, the word Chan, is the same Chinese character in Japanese, a Zen, same. Although the practices between the Chan and Zen vary some, uh, very similar in many respects. The uh, Zen school emphasizes the practice of counting breaths at the beginning, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I always wondered where did this counting of breath come from because it's not in the original teachings of the Buddha. So hopefully we'll be able to answer a little bit of that question today and go a little bit deeper as well. So in the first talk, I explained how there were uh, there was this uh, ancient text that was uh, written, uh, and we don't have the original Sanskrit, but the text was translated into Chinese by um, Anshigao in the year 148 CE, so quite a while ago. But that particular text, uh, which was then full of commentaries because it was so interesting. Many commentaries were written and the commentaries were written right into the text so that we don't know now what the original text was and what the commentaries are. This was the case for many, many years until 1999 when a clean version of the original text was found in a Japanese monastery. Very exciting, actually, two version, two uh, manuscripts copied. So we now have the original text, which is called the Anban Shoyi Jin, and we have the text with all the commentaries in it, which is called the Da Anban Shoyi Jin. Da meaning, in this case, larger or big. Great. So, this text, really the Da'an Ban Chun Jing, and all of the commentaries, or perhaps one of the original versions, we don't know, ended up having an impact on many different schools of Buddhism. So we know that Buddhism, we could say, original teachings of the Buddha, went after he passed away, then... Uh, 18 schools of Buddhism, maybe 20. Of those 18 or 20 original schools, really only one survives today we call Theravadan Buddhism, very uh, well practiced in Southeast Asia and of course in the United States as well. Then around the first millennium uh, CE, then we had the uh, beginning of what's called Mahayana Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism also divided into two major, three major branches, we could say, the Majamaka and the Yogacara. Uh, Sothagata Garbha, if you want to go in, divide it a little bit more, we can say that these schools uh, then were subdivided into uh, these different schools, particularly in China, a lot of different schools, uh, Pure Land School, Tian Tai School, uh, Chan School, and so we became Zen. So we have all of these different schools, makes it a little bit more complicated. But these schools were all uh, impacted by this one text, 
the Anban Shal Yijin. So we can say that the Kumara Jivas, So Chan San Ye Jin, a book on meditation, on Chan meditation, which was translated in 401, uses the same parts as in the Anban Shal Yijin, the same six parts, as does Vasubandhu's teachings. In, in, in one of his texts. And also, we can say that Buddha Gosa, uh, the great writer of Theravadan Buddhism, the original school, also used the same method, as did Master Zhi of the Tian Tai school. And then we can say that this goes all the way to the Zen school, Dogen and uh, Kaizan, the t two teachers of the Soto Zen school. All of these people were uh, affected by this one text. Now the original text, the original discourse delivered by the Buddha was called the Anapanasati. Anapana means inhalation and exhalation. Sati means mindfulness of. So the mindfulness of inhalation and exhalation is what the Buddha taught originally. One of the techniques that the Buddha, not the only one, but one of the main techniques that the Buddha taught. And anapana means inhalation, exhalation. Anban is the Chinese version of anapana. So you can see the connection here. So when people practice anapana sati, they say, oh, I am a practitioner of anapana sati. Well, actually, probably they're only the practitioner of the first of the four tetrads because the later tetrads are for much more advanced people, people whose minds have been trained so well that they no longer have any discursive chatter. Is that possible? Well, you know, if you practice diligently and under the right conditions, the mind can become so quiet that no more discursive thought is taking place. No more internal chatter, storylines those kinds of things, that vanishes. Then the person can enter into a higher stages of concentration. And that's what happens in the second, third, and fourth tetrads of Anapanasati. So most people are just practicing the first part, which has to do with mindfulness of the breath. So in Anapanasati, we have the instruction of uh, breathing in long, or breathing in short, means however you're breathing, you just focus on the breath. You don't worry about the breathing being long or short. You just focus on it. And you notice it. You're aware of how you're breathing. And then mindful of how the breath has, uh, affects the entire body. You're aware of your entire body when you're breathing and you're seeing how your body is feeling. Now this gets expanded in uh, other teachings that the Buddha gave, like Satipatthana. And then, finally, calming the breath. So these are the four aspects. Now, this is really the method that the Buddha taught. But many people, particularly as, they, as lay people, were not able to practice to the extent necessary to go into the higher levels of concentration, we call the jhanas, they weren't able to do that. So they wanted to be able to have methods that would help them in a step-by-step -step graduated way to become deeper into the practice. This must have happened because this is how we have this text in Anban Shri Jing. Okay. So this sutra uh, we can say anban means inhalation, exhalation. Sho means to keep on uh, or maintain. And then uh, e here, it means uh, the process of thinking with intention, intentional thinking. So they don't use the word nian, which would mean the word mindfulness. Here they're just saying maintaining our awareness, maintaining our uh, intention to stay with the breath. So we know from our experience of sitting in meditation that what does the mind want to do when we're sitting there? It just chatters away. 
and sometimes it just travels away randomly, and sometimes it connects to the next part, the next part, and now we have an entire story going on inside of our mind, and the bell rings, and oh, okay, where am I? This is very common experience, not to be something that we are critical of, just something to be aware of. Because as we practice more and more, the tendency to, to want to quiet this mind becomes stronger and the storyline becomes weaker. And so we're able to stay with our practice. This uh, inner chatter is often called the monkey mind. Or if you have a puppy, we can call it the puppy brain. The mind that is always jumping around from topic to topic, oftentimes focused on its main subject, ourself or the people in our lives. We call this the drama or the drama-rama, discursive thinking going round and round, very difficult to stop, always on the job, always giving us comments and commentaries about what has taken place, what is happening, and what might happen in the future. At times, this commentary can be helpful, but at other times, we need to be able to let it go so the commentary doesn't control us. So we're learning how to control that internal chatter. Now, of course, there are neuroscientific correlates of this that we can see when people are having internal chatter, there are higher levels of activity in an area of the brain called the posterior cingulate. We're having less of that activity, the posterior cingulate, not so strong, more the anterior cingulate is active. So it's not like the brain goes offline. There are things going on, but if there's a change. If the anterior, uh, the posterior cingulate gets negative, it activates the amygdala, fight, flight, freeze syndrome, the negative feelings and emotions, which then activates negative thinking in the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. When a person calms their mind down, they're not having that activity, so the activity actually flows more directly, straightforward, from an area called the nucleus accumbens, that into the right, into the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex for positive thinking. So much more direct, straightforward joyfulness that takes place, which is one of the stages of the first uh, entrance into the higher levels of jhana or concentration stage. So we're practicing this stopping in order to decrease this activity so it doesn't activate that part of the brain that becomes negative. So that's really the first step of the practice. The second stages, observing, returning, and purifying are more advanced. This has to do with the learning how to stop the practice of this internalization of creating a self. Find that. Okay. So um, the creation of the self has to do with taking a part of our of who we are, which is divided into five parts called the five aggregates and turning that one or all of those into, this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. And this tendency is very strong. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. So that's a little bit of review. In the seven sets of these 37 prerequisites of enlightenment. Now I talked about the Anapanasati, which was the original teachings of the Buddha. 
Another set of original teachings of the Buddha are these 37 prerequisites divided into seven sets. So when the Buddha gave a summary of all of the teachings, he said, I practice these seven sets. So this includes all, nearly all of the teachings that the Buddha gave in kind of a summary form. You know that the Buddha originally taught the Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path, and that's here. He taught about the uh, seven prerequisites to enlightenment. Talked about the factors of enlightenment. Those are here as well. So many of these teachings are here. So uh, we can say that, you know, we start with the four foundations of mindfulness, another one of the teachings that the Buddha gave on meditation. And then the four right efforts and the four roads to power and the four uh, five root faculties and the five powers and the seven factors of enlightenment, the eightfold path. So these are the seven sets that are given. And all of this is discussed in the Anban Shoyi Jing. So not only did he talk about Anapanasati, but he made an attempt to the person who, was, who had composed this original Sanskrit and then translated it into Chinese really made an attempt to, to do a broad overview of all of the Buddhist teachings. So he connected this by way of the six parts of the uh, breathing technique. So the four foundations of mindfulness were correlated with counting, the four right efforts correlated with following the four um, roots, uh, roads to power, excuse me, connected to stopping, and then the um, five roots and the five powers connected to observing, and then the seven limbs connected or the uh, factors connected to returning, and then the eightfold path connected to purifying. We want to go into more detail of all the 37 factors that are here. You can make take a snapshot of that with you. <laughs> so this counting. We just as I said, we count on the breath. There's no counting in Anapanasati. But here we do the counting. This is the method to try to interrupt and to stop the internal chatter. Now, in Satipatthana, the, the mindfulness of the body, for example, uh, there are different parts of the body that the person will focus on, go through the entire body. In the modern school of it started by John Kabat-Zinn, mindfulness-based stress reduction. He divides the body into many different parts on the outside, all of the different muscle groups, all the different limbs, and goes through all of those very carefully, just as the Buddha did. But when the Buddha actually taught the mindfulness of the body, he had 32 parts, 23 of them were internal talked about the internal organs, being able to contact the heart and the lungs and the liver and the spleen and the, and the pancreas and the different the intestines, even the different liquids in the body, the blood, all of the, the urine, all of the different parts of the body, saliva, mucus, all of the different parts of the body we would focus on. But there was, I don't think that there was counting. But here, the element is not so much focusing on the different parts of the body, which is focusing on counting so that the mind can calm down. And following, this is the uh, four right efforts. When we notice that something is happening that is unwholesome within the mind or in our, particularly in our actions or our speech, we notice what's unwholesome and we use restraint. We stop ourselves. Oh, I better not say that. I better not do that. Even thinking that, oh, this is troublesome. Let me use restraint. 
then we can go in and see what is the root of this? Where is this really starting from? How come I'm having these unwholesome thoughts and words and actions? Where is the root of that? I want to uproot that. That's the second one. So after we use restraint, we uproot it so it's no longer there. And then we cultivate what it is that's wholesome, the good qualities that we have, the good things that we want to do, the good words that we want to say. And then we maintain that. That's the fourth. So these are the four right efforts. And this is correlated with this notion of following. So we're not exactly sure how this was practiced back in 148, but we can see that the correlation exists in the teaching. And then stopping related to the different uh, um, parts of what are called the four roads or the basis of power. So we want to develop a, an internal power. I know the word power is a strange word. You know, uh, now in the, you know, we have uh, Marvel comics and things like that. You know, people want to have superpowers. So yes, we want to develop some superpowers ourselves. What are these superpowers? These are the powers that allow us to continue to practice, even though we're getting lots of distraction and lots of influence from other places. You look around and see all of the different influences out there. It's very easy to get drawn in by someone else telling us, oh, you need to do that. Oh, this is better for you. Oh, you need to buy this product. So this aspiration, this positive, wholesome desire to have the ability to be on the path and not fall off. This is a power. This is, a, this is truly a, a kind of superpower. This is what we call stopping ourselves from getting engaged in things that are problematic, even when difficulties arise. And so this takes diligence and it takes an awareness of our mind. We need to know where our mind is going. And it also requires us to have good inquiry. We need to question, hmm, what, do, what is it that I'm doing here? Do I want to do this or do I want to do that? Do I want to make the right choice here? So I have to have the ability to actually be curious and inquire, not just follow something blindly. Observing, Guan the same word as guan yin. It means many different things. Guan can mean um, observe, contemplate, pay attention to something. So here we're paying attention to the faculties that we want to develop. This ability to have confidence that we're on the right path, to trust ourselves, to have faith, in the teachings and what it is that we're doing. Again, effort and diligence is required. We need to develop this quality of mindfulness so that the mind does not go off and get distracted by things so much. We develop concentration, this deeper ability to go deeper into uh, the states of mind uh, and be able to overcome these five aggregates that want to tell us what the self is. And so we become wise. We develop a, a good sense of wisdom. So this is part of the observing. So I want to say something about the self because we had a series of very good teachings on self and non-self by Tanisaro Bhikkhu 
uh, last year. The self is not something that either exists or doesn't exist. It just is something that is different than how we usually think of it. So I was trying to come up with a way to explain this. And I was thinking about a person who uh, identifies themselves as a, uh, a musician, a pianist, or a violinist, or a cellist. And so when they are in front of their instrument, their hand functions to play the instrument. But when they are not in front of the instrument, they're not playing the instrument with their hand. And they may not be walking around all the time thinking, oh, I am a violinist. Or oh, I am a great violinist. That might be the ego attachment. They're just a person going about their day. They're violinists when they get up on the stage and they play or they play for their friends or however they play, or even when they're playing for themselves. So we say that this is the function. So the self has a function. If you try to get rid of the function of the self and you get in your car on the way home here, not so good. You may end up in a tree. I would not want that to happen to any of us. And you talk to the policeman and you say, oh, that guy, Don Ye Ye, he told me that I didn't have a self, so I just let go of that. I just let go of the tree. This is a problem. So the self has a very important function. This is something that Tanisara Bhikkhu talked about from his, his framework. So when you are, when you need the self, you use the self as a function. When you want to cook noodles, you know, you put the noodles in the pot. When you're not cooking the noodles, you don't walk around with the pot. That would be very strange. But there are times where you want to drop the self, where you realize the self is just a function. There, this function actually, there's, there's an essence here of who we are, separate from who we are. This we call emptiness in uh, Mahayana Buddhism. In Chinese, there's a phrase called ti yong, which means ti yong, which means uh, essence and function. It means things that are look opposite are actually not so opposite. They're interconnected with each other and they make the framework of, of, of this life that we live. So the self and non-self actually exist and don't exist at the same time together. That's a little bit unique to kind of look at things that way. So we challenge you that way. And that's what the advanced observing is about when it comes to the aggregates. The aggregates both exist and don't exist at the same time and don't not exist. So this is a little bit confusing. So returning is even a little bit more subtle because in returning, we're actually paying attention to not just the big storylines and the big chatter in the mind, we're, we're actually more aware of very, very tiny elements of chatter. More refined, which allows us then to experience the origin and the cessation of each slide. And so we return then to the quietude of the mind. And purifying is that what is when the mind completely is able to go into the uh, complete understanding of the Eightfold Path, Four Noble Truths, etc. No obstacle there. So I'm going to leave us a little bit with a with a quote here. Uh, and this may be familiar to uh, some uh, Chinese speakers. Uh, but this quote is actually written in the third century uh, BCE in China. So it's not necessarily Buddhist, but it has some very interesting qualities to it. 
It's uh, from the classic book of music. So it says here, a man is born quiescent, very calm, as it is his inborn nature. His mind moves in response to external things, which is the nature of desire. As he encounters things, he knows more and more, subsequently giving rise to the forms that are liked and disliked. When liking and disliking, these are not regulated within. His awareness is enticed to the external things. He cannot reflect upon himself and his inborn principle disappears. If we were gonna have a lot of Chinese speakers here, I was gonna ask one of you. They're venerable to do it in Chinese, but I think they're okay. So we can end our talk here on um, time and uh, be able to uh, dedicate the merit together in this talk, I hope. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings never be separated from the altruistic joy which is free from suffering. And may all beings dwell in the great equanimity which is free from attachment, aversion, and ignorance. It's four immeasurable qualities. Very, very important. Thank you all.